what's, what's the, the difference, difference between, between, between a group of friends and a clique? I wrote, wrote this script when I was on what do, I, what do I actually want to say to, to my spankos. friends? I have such a tiny platform, but I might as well. I, I, I might as well. I wrote this video at an interesting moment in my social life. I don't know whether to call this moment merely the beginning of something or its apex. And we won't find out which it was until it's all over and we autopsy its life. But I have created, I have helped create, I have borne witness to something. I'm not trying to praise myself here. I'm not saying I've helped build anything unique or done anything that hasn't been done before, but here it is just a community like any other. And I've watched it have children. Okay, enough druggy bull It's time to say what I'm actually talking about. <laughs> Friendships form on the basis of what sociologists call homophily, homophily, which is the tendency of humans to form strong connections with other people who have similar characteristics. Birds of a feather flock together, that whole kind of thing. In my community, the homophily is pretty obvious. We're all obsessed with spanking. But according to anthropologist Robin Dunbar, there is a limit to the number of meaningful and stable relationships that humans can support at any one time. Dunbar breaks it down like this. Our brains can handle up to about five intimate bonds, 15 close friendships, 50 friendships, and about 150 casual friends. The circle of acquaintances can hold as many as 500 people. A number that has been on my mind lately since that's about the size of my own community at the moment. Anything higher than these numbers is just too complicated for most human brains to handle at optimal processing levels. I like to imagine this a bit like a house party. There are only so many people any one room can comfortably hold at a time. So at a certain point, micro parties start to form in adjacent rooms. That's healthy, natural, natural and, and inevitable. inevitable. But it's also scary. As I was writing this script, there was a moment when I checked in on my own community. And in that particular moment, almost all of the social interaction was happening in some of these splinter cells, the adjacent rooms. A bunch of people were chatting in one of the voice channels, but it wasn't one of the most public or accessible channels. It was a channel that had been set up specifically for people in the United Kingdom. In another room, everyone in the San Francisco Bay Area was talking to everyone else in that area. This happens in the national and international Spanko scenes too, of course. Everyone comes together for a big national party like Shadow Lodge or TASP, and then retreats to their own smaller online networks after that party is over. Like I said, this is healthy, natural, and inevitable. And geography makes a lot of sense as an extra layer of homophily that binds people together. If you're looking for dates or play partners or friends, which most of us are, it makes sense to start with people in your area. And if you listened to my advice in Spanko drama and are trying to build friendships with other Spankos on a foundation that includes more than just butt stuff, it also makes sense to focus on people who live nearby since you know they can meet you for a movie or a glass of wine. So I understand and even admire all this, but it, it also, also scares, scares me. me. I'm part of the community I started, but I'm not really in it. And I've realized that I never really can be. And I'm coming to terms with that. I have responsibilities, you know? I'm not a guest at the party, I'm a host. And to me, that means making sure everyone else is having a good time is more important to me than thinking about myself or my good time. So this moment when I compared the activity in all these splinter cells to the relative calm, at least in that moment, of the main, more accessible parts of the party, I got scared. I was worried that new friends might show up. People who had not yet embedded in the community enough to learn where these adjacent rooms are and feel left out. What's the difference between a group of friends and a clique? For the purposes of this conversation, I'm going to proceed from the assumption that a clique is something bad, something we don't want to be. That assumption itself is very open to criticism. For starters, I bet when I just say the word click, none of us is imagining a group of men right now. But toxic friendships definitely do exist, and I think it's fair to say we don't want to be toxic. Click just happens to be a term that most of us immediately recognize as a way to describe toxic friend groups. According to the internet, which is never wrong. A clique is any group of friends that retains and exercises the power to eject 
bad members. members. By that definition, all of the Spanko communities, including my own, are definitely cliques. Every few years, we have a community-wide debate about how to deal with people who have been accused of abuse or unethical behavior. The Spanko scene in the United States is having a reckoning with that very question right now. A video about that conversation is definitely coming, probably more than one. But the bottom, bottom line, line is, I don't just think it's fine that the Spanko communities sometimes eject bad members. I think it's good and necessary. But there's also a pressure to conform within cliques, and that's where I think the question of whether the Spanko communities are toxic starts to fall apart. In some ways, yes, we absolutely do expect people to conform with certain non-negotiable standards, like respect for consent. But in other ways, the homophily that binds spanking fetishists together is the most diverse expression of homophily I have ever experienced. Right now, my own community has people from six different continents. There are millionaires and there is a literal refugee. At our most recent spanking party, I looked around the table at dinner one night and could not imagine another setting that would bring together such an unbelievably diverse group. It was beautiful. Friendship, Friendship. itself is a drug. It's intoxicating and addictive and mind-altering. But drugs can be healthy, like exercise, or arguably unhealthy, like <laughs> To me, the key difference between a healthy friendship community and a toxic one or click is whether that group is expansive or not. And that specific topic brings us back to the kinds of healthy and inevitable subgroups I talked about before. And my request for Spankos. Pay it forward however you're able. Please don't forget. Here's what I mean by that. Being not lonely is kind of like going to your first spanking party, I think. Do you remember how the prospect of going to your first munch or party felt like this huge, terrifying thing? But when you finally took the leap and walked through that door, after only like 10 minutes, it suddenly felt like the most natural thing in the world, right? You couldn't believe that you were ever scared of this. In, in fact, fact, it becomes difficult to remember how intimidated you used to be. It's hard for me to remember. The person I once was, the one who was so tangled up in shame and fear that I didn't think those knots could ever be untied. I don't know her anymore. I think it's the same with friends and community or feeling understood. When you don't have those things, the absence of them is crushing and impossible to ignore. But, but the, the second, second you, you find, find them, them those, those bad memories start to fade. Having a community feels obvious and inevitable. And just like we forget the fear of going to our first spanking party, we forget the loneliness too. It's kind of a mercy in a way. Who wants to remember all that? Who doesn't want to look forward to better things? But spankos need to remember. We can't let ourselves forget. I'll give you an example from years ago, long before I was helping run an online community or even before I had a YouTube channel. At that point, I was only writing about spanking in articles and my book. But that was enough for some people to reach out to me. One woman did. I'll call her Mia. Mia wrote to me about how lonely she was, about how desperately she wanted to connect with someone, and about how viscerally she craved community. So I helped her find all that, and she got happier. Mia met Spanko friends and started going to parties. She even met a dom who became her boyfriend, and she moved in with him. She was my friend, you know? She still is my friend. But she forgot about the loneliness, I guess. Because a few years later, someone else who lived in the same city as Mia emailed me with the exact, exact same, same feelings Mia had once described. The same loneliness, the same thirst for community. I asked Mia if she could please shoot that person an email just to say hi and maybe connect her with the local scene. Mia said yes, but then she just didn't do it. I followed up a few times, but Mia never emailed that woman. She was too busy. She said, too busy. I've seen this exact scenario play out a lot of times, like a lot. In fact, most of the times when I've asked a Spanko I helped to pay it forward for someone else, they didn't end up doing it. My theory about why this happens is we are so used to thinking of this thing we do as an intensely personal secret that can never be shared with anyone else. So it's hard to transition from thinking of it as a purely individual experience to thinking of it as a community thing, with all of the responsibilities and obligations that being part of a community entails. The other context in which I see people forget to pay it forward is when spankos couple up. This happens in sex-oriented contexts too, so I'm sure you already know the drill. People find their person and disappear into a couple bubble. That's fine for sex-oriented people who get to exist in an environment that constantly recognizes and validates their sexualities. But people with paraphilias, 
don't have that. The only validation we get is from each other. So I do think we have an obligation, especially once we've coupled up, to help new people integrate. We can't turn inward and just forget about them. I think my generation did a lot of good, but also, in my opinion, some harm with its emphasis on self-care above obligation to others. I see a lot of memes like this, and I get that it's a joke and I do think it's funny, but my heart also really goes out to the idea of this second person who tries to reach out for connection and just gets pricked instead. I'm not saying don't care for yourself. Please do care for yourself. But also please try to care for others however and whenever you can. You absolutely should savor and embrace your smaller friend groups, but don't let yourself forget what it was like when you didn't have them. You have to make it intentional because the natural and inevitable psychology of our brains push pushes us to find smaller groups and stay there. Resist it, just a little. Try to stay expansive. Ooh, do you want a real a spicy, spicy meatball? It's me, Mario. Okay, the meatball isn't spicy, but the take is hot. Here's something that I personally make the personal choice to do. And it's not politically correct, and it's not going to sound good, and it's going to piss some people off, and I am definitely not encouraging anyone else to do this. I am merely describing a choice that I make. At parties, sometimes I play with people even if I'm not enthusiastic about it. I consent, of course, it's all consensual, but sometimes if I meet someone who is feeling awkward or left out, yeah, yeah, I usually make the choice to play with that person. I'm not necessarily enthusiastic about the play itself, but like, I am enthusiastic about people not feeling lonely. I'm enthusiastic about people not feeling excluded. And my partner Dan does the same thing. He doesn't personally get anything out of topping men, for instance, but he does it anyway sometimes because we think it's nice and we want to be nice. And for us, being nice in that way does not cost us anything or violate our boundaries. It's hard to remember the people we haven't met yet, but try to remember them, okay? Keep doors open. For what it's worth, I think we're actually doing pretty good. That moment I described, that moment when I checked in on my own community and was a little alarmed to see more activity happening in these more exclusive subgroups than was happening in the more accessible channels? Well, a few hours later, one of our community members experienced a tragedy. And one by one, I watched people step away from their subgroups and return to the core to comfort him. Spanking fetishists are a minuscule subsection of a tiny group that belongs to a small demographic that barely exists. We have to look out for each other. Maybe you can't reach out by writing articles or making videos, but you can reach out in other ways. If you go to a big party and meet a newcomer to the scene, consider inviting that person to join your WhatsApp group. Maybe you don't want to play with the lonely, awkward dude in the corner of the party, but you can at least go chat with him for a while. Or if you have the opportunity to email a newcomer to the scene who lives in your area to say, welcome, do it. I don't believe you're too busy to give other Spankos what I wish someone had given us. Spanko friendships are the best drug in the world, but we can't keep that drug to ourselves. Don't burrow into your own high so much that you forget about everyone else. Spanko friendships are a drug that becomes stronger and more powerful the more we use it. And it's the only drug that has an even stronger kick when, when we pass it around. Picture yourself in a boat on a river with tangerine trees and marmalade skies. Somebody calls you, you answer quite slowly. A girl with kaleidoscope eyes. Cellophane flowers of yellow. i